In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Divine Jesus, you have said, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Behold us kneeling at your feet, filled with lively faith and confidence in the promises dictated by your sacred heart and pronounced by your adorable lips. We come to ask this favor. and merit. Where should we seek if not in the treasure which contains all the riches of your kindness and mercy? Where must we knock if not at the door through which God gives himself to us and through which we go to God? We have opened up ourselves to you, heart of Jesus. In you, we find consolation when afflicted, protection when persecuted, strength when burdened with trials, and light in doubt and darkness. Dear Jesus, we firmly believe that you can grant us the grace we implore, even though it should require a miracle. We have only to will it, and our prayers will be granted. We admit that we are most unworthy of your favors, but this is not a reason for us to be discouraged. You are the God of mercy, and you will not refuse a contrite heart. O sacred heart, whatever may be your decision with regard to our request, we will never stop adoring loving, praising, and serving you. Lord Jesus, we plead that you accept this our act of perfect resignation to the decrees of your adorable heart, which we sincerely desire to be fulfilled in us and all your creatures forever. Sacred Heart of Jesus, we know that there is but one thing impossible to you, to be without pity for those who are suffering and distressed. Look upon us, we beg of you, dear Jesus, and grant us the grace for which we humbly implore you through the immaculate heart of your most sorrowful mother. You have entrusted us to her as her children, and her prayers are all-powerful with you. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the celebration of the first Friday Mass for the month of February. This Mass is being sponsored and hosted by the Southern Tagalog Area, STR1B. Tonight's Mass is presided by Reverend Father Herb Snyder. Please join us in singing the opening song.
We begin our Eucharistic celebration in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion in the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, we are in God's holy presence. Let us ask him to forgive us our sins and to prepare our hearts for the celebration of this Eucharist. Lord Jesus Christ, you came to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to save sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at God's right hand to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. May the virgin martyr, St. Agatha, whose feast we celebrate today, uh, entreat for us your compassion, O Lord, we pray. For she found favor with you by the courage of her martyrdom and the merit of her chastity. Through Christ our Lord, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And let us now listen to the, to the reading. The first reading is taken from the book of Hebrews. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect hospitality, for through it some have unknowingly entertained angels. Be mindful of prisoners, as if sharing their imprisonment, and of all the ill-treated as of yourselves. For you also are in the body, that merits be honored among all, and the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge the immoral and adulterers. Let your life be free from love of money, but be content with what has. For he has said, I will never forsake you or abandon you. Thus we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, and I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war be waged upon me, even then will I trust. The Lord is my light and my salvation. For he will hide me in his abode in the day of trouble. He will conceal me in the shelter of his tent. He will set me high upon a rock. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Your presence, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. Do not in anger repel your servant. You are my helper. Cast me not off. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed are they who have kept the word with a generous heart, and yield the harvest of perseverance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard about Jesus, for his fame had become widespread. And people were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why mighty powers are at work in him. Others were saying he is Elijah, and still others, he is one of the prophets. But Herod, when Herod learned of it, he said, 
it is John the Baptist whom I beheaded. He has been raised up. Now Herod was the one who had John imprisoned and uh, John bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, whom he had married. John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias harbored a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but was unable to do so. Herod feared John, knowing him to be a righteous man, a righteous and upright man and holy man, and kept him in prison. But when he heard John, he was very much perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. Herodias had an opportunity one day when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee. His own daughter came in and performed a dance that delighted uh, Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, ask of me whatever you want and wish, and I will give granted to you. He swore even an oath, and he said, I will give you whatever you ask for, even half of, of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? Her mother said, the head of John the Baptist. The girl returned to the king's presence and made her request. I want you to give me at once on a platter, the head of John the Baptist. The king was deeply distressed, but because of his oath and the guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And so he promptly dispatched an executioner with orders to bring back the head, to bring back his head. He went out and beheaded John in prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples learned about this, they came and took away his body and buried it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let me first give a little bit of background so we can understand the story a bit better. And then after that, I want to make some comments about the king. Uh, first of all, a banquet in those days, whether in Palestine or throughout the Greco-Roman world, always had two parts. The first one was called in Greek, dipnon, which meant a dinner party. So that was normally what started it all, was people sat down and had a more lavish dinner. But after the dinner, the second part, uh, was, let me call it in, in quotation marks, the entertainment part. And it could range from philosophical discussion, like for example, the dialogues of Plato, which recall the, the custom of Socrates, the, the Greek philosopher, who also would meet with his friends after dinner and they would discuss philosophy. So that second part could be a very serious, learned discussion, exchange of ideas. But on the other end, it could also be the time when you bring in the dancing girls and, uh, you know, that kind of entertainment. And that's what we have here. But the amazing thing is that, first of all, on a, on a dinner party or banquet, the women were not part of it. This was totally a men's affair. Only later on in, in Roman times, the wives could be present, but only for the dinner, not for the entertainment. And no daughter would ever appear. But here, the daughter of King Herod comes in and she performs a task that no decent girl would ever perform. Because we have to kind of think of that like a belly dance. And so that's, and, and then the king is so delighted that, and here we get kind of like uh, a, a man of rash judgment. Sure, his guests obviously, I mean, enjoyed the show, and so did he, 
And so he promises the girl what he actually cannot keep. For example, he swears an oath that he would give her even half of his kingdom, but he was king by the pleasure of the Romans. And without Roman permission, he could not alienate any part of his kingdom. But then when he, you know, is brought up short by the request of the girl for the head of John the Baptist, you know, again, he doesn't have the courage to, to kind of to undo the wrong that he had actually done by making that kind of promise and swearing that kind of oath. And he reveals himself as a man of no character and no principles. And so we have the kind of government leader, in a sense, a king, that, that is really not for the common good, that really ignores the human rights. There is no justice in there, but it's also a weak character. Actually, Jesus, in the gospel, in another play, he calls Herod Fox. He says, tell that Fox, you know, etc. And uh, when we look and think of the gospel, there's also a great lesson for us that in our own life, you know, kind of like the, the gospels and Paul, they kind of stress that our yes should be yes, our no should be no. There should nothing else was needed except that integrity, that honesty, you know, and it's that that the gospel stresses. It wants us to be men, yes, of our word, but our word should be such that it brings honor and glory to God and not buy into the whims or the anger or the emotional outbreak of anybody. And so let us pray that the Lord would give us wisdom, first of all, to promise and to, to commit ourselves to what is really in line with his will and with his commandments. And second, give us the courage that if we do anything wrong, we would also have the courage to kind of uh, make things right. And so a great example, of course, for today's Mass is St. Agatha, who was a young girl, unmarried, and she was put in prison and they tried to rape her and things like that. And she defended her, her honor, her integrity, and finally gave her life for Christ. And that's why she's a great example today, a counter example to King Herod and an inspiration. She can be an inspiration to all of us. And so as we go on with this mass, let us pray for wisdom to make right decisions and for the courage to stick to them, and or if we do something that wasn't right after all, we would have the courage to undo it. And so now let us bring to the Lord all our petitions and all our needs, and then our response be, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Holy Catholic Church, for Pope Francis, for all the bishops, priests, deacons, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of the nations, may they serve the people with humility, justice, and compassion. May they promote equality and fairness, as well as be good shepherds to the people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who are weakened by sickness and infirmity, may they be assured of love and support of their family and loved ones. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, for the BCBP community, we pray that we continue to work on evangelizing the businessmen and professionals of bringing Christ into the marketplace as we continue our personal transformation. We pray for the whole BCBP community. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That eternal salvation be granted to the faithful departed. May God welcome and accept them in his kingdom. May strength of spirit and faithful acceptance be granted to the loved ones they left behind. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In silence, we pray for our personal intentions. 
we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we bring to you these and all our needs, and we ask you in your goodness and mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and our hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed be God forever. Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. For the wine and work of human hands, it will become for us the drink of life. Amen. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name for our good and good of all his holy church. May this offering we bring in celebration of blessed Agatha with your gracious acceptance, O Lord, we pray, just as the struggle of her suffering and passion was pleasing to you through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. We lift him up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, your word, through whom you made all things, whom you send as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, in fulfilling your will and gaining for your holy people. He stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so with all the angels and with all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord of God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fund of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and ended willingly into his passion, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of, and drink of it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, and Esther, our Bishop, the clergy, and all your people. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And all those who have died in, 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 your, in your grace. Grant them a place in the light of your faith. Have mercy on us all, we pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, 
with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and with all the saints, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And now full of confidence and joy, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and saved from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you my peace i give you look not on our sins but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever amen the peace of the lord be always with you and with your spirit and let us exchange that peace with one another lamb of god lamb of god you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with faith in your love and mercy, we eat your body and drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and body. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. How happy are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The body of Christ. an act of spiritual communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, we come to you in our need to ask your protection against the COVID-19 that has disturbed and even claimed lives. We pray that you guide the people tasked to find cures for this disease and to stem its transmission. Protect the medical experts that they may minister to the sick with competence and compassion. We pray for those afflicted, may they be restored to health soon. Protect those who care for them. Grant eternal rest to those who have died. Give us the grace in this trying time to work for the good of all and to help those in need. We implore you to stop the spread of this virus and to save us from our fears. Grant all these through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We fly to your protection, O Holy Mother of God. Do not despise our petition in our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers. 
O glorious and blessed Virgin. Amen. Our Lady, health of the sick, pray for us. Saint Raphael, the Archangel, pray for us. Saint Rock, pray for us. Saint Lorenzo Ruiz, pray for us. Saint Pedro Calungsod, pray for us. Let us pray. O God, who bestowed on blessed Agatha a crown uh, among the saints for her twofold triumph of virginity and martyrdom, grant, we pray, through the power of her intercession, that we may have the courage to avoid every evil and to walk in the path of your life. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Eucharist is ended. Let us continue to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. We would like to acknowledge the following.
Area Managing Director Alma Monong, Regional Council Director of Southern Tagalog Region 1B, Ed Ancheta, and the members of the Regional Council of Southern Tagalog Region 1B, composed of Chapter Head Jason Lontok of Binyan Chapter, Chapter Head Pete Petras of Santa Rosa Chapter, Chapter Head Manny Martin of General Trias Chapter, Chapter Head Rad Sumera of Imos Chapter, and Chapter Head Cesar Hieronimo of Santa Rosa Novali Chapter, and also the Outreach Heads composed of Outreach Head Lib Cabalhin of San Pedro Outreach, Will Laranio of Carmona Outreach, and Mike Carrios of Tagaytay Silang Outreach. We would like also to acknowledge the technical team of Nubali Chapter and the music ministry of General Priyas Chapter. Thank you very much for your participation. Good evening, everyone. Hello, everybody. Uh, we are beginning today our study of the Gospel of Mark. And of course, this very first meeting will be devoted to introductory questions. And we want to begin actually at the very beginning. And I beg your patience if some of the things is already well known to you, but in that way, we bring everybody onto the same page and we all start with the same kind of background knowledge that we actually should have. And so let me begin at the very beginning and ask the question, what does the word gospel mean? And it comes actually from an older form of English and it's a composite of two words. The first is God which doesn't mean God, but good, and spell means news. So it literally means good news. And it translates exactly the Greek word evangelion, or in Filipino, evangelio, uh, where in Greek, the first, the prefix of eu, ev, uh, means glad or joyful, or good, and then angelion means news. So it translates the Greek word exactly. Now, if you were back in those days of our Lord or even earlier, and you were out in the Greco-Roman Empire, and you used the word evangelio, evangelion, uh, the, the pagan population of Gentiles, what would come into their mind would be, first of all, news of victory. A city would be at war with another city. There would be a battle. Uh, of course, there were no cell phones, no telephone lines, no nothing. But then after the battle, a runner would appear in the city and he would cry out, uh, I have great news for you. We won. The enemy is beaten back. That's the, the, the basic meaning in a secular environment of good news. And then, of course, it gets expanded uh, also to uh, 
the coronation of a king or an emperor, that's Evangelion, or the birth of an heir to the king or emperor. And finally, even the decrees of an emperor, like C Caesar Augustus, we have inscriptions from Asia Minor that actually refer to the decrees of the emperor as good news, as gospels. Now, when you move from the, the secular Greco-Roman environment to Israel, to, to the Israelites, and you use the word there, it would have a different meaning. And it would mean that God has begun to actually rule over the hearts and minds of men. And one text that comes immediately to mind is from Isaiah. And it says, how beautiful on the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, and of course, where God reigns, oppression, tyranny, marginalization, injustice, all those things are removed together with sickness and death and uh, corruption. So, and, and where God rules, there is the fullness of life. Now, when you move from that to the New Testament, the word gospel was used from the very beginning in the, in the preaching of the apostles and the early missionaries. And what they meant by that, by gospel, by the good news, was what happened on Good Friday, on Easter Sunday, on Ascension Day, and on Pentecost. In other words, it, the good news is the Paschal mystery, the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, uh, the uh, resurrection of our Lord, and uh, the ascension to God's right hand in glory, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so the first, uh, in, the, in the early days, gospel was not a book, but it was the preach, the oral word of the, the apostles. And you find examples of that kind of preaching in the book of Acts, and you also find it in, uh, in one, one of the oldest forms, actually, in 1 Corinthians 15. And that's the one I would like to read for you. And the reason for that, why that is so important, is because it's probably one of the earliest testimonies of the content of the gospel. Because remember, 1 Corinthians was written around 55, but Paul says, I hand on to you what I myself received. So the, what he hands on is much older and it may well go back to the early 40s and maybe into the late 30s. So it's, it's a proclamation, a summary, very close to the actual events. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4, what I handed on to you is of first, as of first importance, what I myself uh, re first received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. So Christ died for our sins, he was buried, a sign that he was really dead, and he was raised from the dead for our justification. But why now did Mark write a book? And then after him, Matthew and Luke and John. Why were the gospel books written? Or why was the preached gospel put in the form of a book? I think there are probably two reasons for that. The first reason is that the, the distance between the events and where the church was became longer and longer and longer. And there was a fear that essential things of what Jesus did and what he said would be forgotten, would no longer be remembered. And in order to capture what was really important of Jesus' ministry, that was one of the reasons why ultimately the preached gospel was put in written form. But the other one too was 
there was a great need in the church to know more than just what happened on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, Ascension Day, and Pentecost. Because so many new people were coming in, and so many were non-Jews. And so they needed to be instructed into the, in the way of Christ. And so more information of what Jesus said, of what Jesus taught, was needed for the formation of converts and for uh, leading those who were converted and baptized to maturity in the faith. And that was another reason why ultimately the gospel books were put into operation. Now, when did all this happen? Uh, generally speaking, because the gospel books themselves do not have a date, but through reading between the lines and looking at all the evidence carefully, today, the Gospel of Mark was probably written around the year 70. Now, 70 is an important year because that was the year when Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed by the Romans, and then they also destroyed the temple. Now, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke come about 15 years later, roughly. So around the year 85. And the Gospel of John is later still. It's written between 90 and 100. But as I said, we will go back to that, to the, to the dating of Mark. And I give you some of the reasons of why it is dated in this particular way. Now, the question we want to ask now is, is what about the attribution of the gospel to Mark? And who is that Mark? Now, again, you need to remember that in the early, uh, in the manuscripts, there's no reference to an author, whether Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John. No? So there's no, there's no reference to a real concrete name. And the Gospel of Mark, that attribution comes from the second century. There was people that copying it, they identified the scroll as being the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of John. But the Gospels themselves, the authors, uh, do not reveal their identity. And so again, you kind of like get that by tradition. So the tradition says that it was John Mark whose mother was called Mary, and in whose house the early Jerusalem church met, was the author of the Gospel of Mark. Now, John Mark, according to the Book of Acts, was also the cousin of Barnabas. Barnabas was the one who brought Paul from, uh, from his hometown of Tarsus to Antioch, as his companion on the first missionary journey. Now, uh, Barnabas, and then later on in the Pauline letters, uh, especially Colossians, uh, uh, Mark is mentioned as an associate of Paul, and later in the tradition also of Peter. Now, if you remember the book of Acts, Barnabas and Paul are set aside by the prophet of, by the prophet of the community to go on a missionary journey. And Barnabas takes John Mark, his cousin, along. But after their missionary journey to Crete, Barnabas abandons them and goes back to Jerusalem. On a second missionary journey, also planned by Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas again wants to bring John Mark along. But Paul refuses. And so Barnabas and Paul part ways uh, over the question of John Mark. But later on, it seems to be that John Mark became a faithful follower both of Paul and of Peter. Now, where do we get all this information from? Actually, it comes from a bishop by the name of Papias. He lived between 60 after Christ to 110 after Christ, who wrote about five books on sayings of the apostles and of the Lord, which are all lost. But a few fragments of them are quoted verbatim in a 4th century church history by Eusebius. So, and Papias was bishop of a town in Asia Minor uh, called, that was called Hierapolis. It's, and today its name is, in, in, in the Turkish Empire, is Pamukkale. Now, 
again, this is the, the quote that we find in Papias about Mark. So Mark, he says, it is capacity as Peter's interpreter, uh, wrote down accurately as many things as he could recall from memory, though not in order, in an ordered form, of the things either said or done by the Lord. So Papia says, Mark was Peter's interpreter, and he wrote down from memory what Peter said, so not in an ordered form, uh, what Peter said about the things that the Lord said and did. Okay, now, because Peter's interpreter would kind of like presuppose an environment, a language environment of, of a language that Peter didn't know, so it cannot be Palestine because there Peter could have spoken for himself in Aramaic or Hebrew, but possibly Latin in Rome. Although in Rome they also spoke Greek, so it could have also been the Greek language. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, exegetes say that the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome. Now, and that's still the most widely held uh, uh, opinion that you also find in introductions to, to, to commentaries on the Gospel of Mark, or even introductions in our Bible to, to the Gospel. But it's not the only opinion, because uh, another opinion is that it was written really in the north of Palestine or the south of Syria. Uh, reason is... Uh, you know, because even there, he could have functioned as an interpreter if uh, the Papias notice is correct. Now, or even in Alexandria, Egypt, one of the reasons for that one, although it's probably not likely, is that one of the earliest fragments of the Gospel of Mark was found in Alexandria. And if you look at internal evidence of the Gospel, you get the idea that it must have been written very close to the fall of Jerusalem or so either a year or two before or a year or two after. And the reason is this. In chapter 13 of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives or Jesus leaves the temple to go to the Mount of Olives and he foretells the destruction of the temple. But he foretells the, the difficulty or the, 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 the war scenario of Jerusalem in such a way that's a little bit vague. I mean, it's definite about the destruction, but the details are not very clear. And so it must have been uh, at a time close to it that you could foresee it, but you couldn't quite see how. Now, when you go to, and uh, because both Luke and Matthew have the same thing, but when you read theirs, uh, it's much more clear and much more definite. So you, that's one of the reasons why you put them afterwards. What happened in Jerusalem was well known. And so they could kind of like change the more vague prophecy of Jesus into something much more concrete. So Mike is earlier. So nowadays, exegetes would uh, dated between 68, maybe one, two years before the fall of Jerusalem, or one or two years after, before the news of what actually happened spread. And so in this little introduction, what did we really learn? Well, first of all, we learned about the author, that the author is John Mark, a son of a certain Mary uh, from Jerusalem, um, who was a cousin of Barnabas and got involved in ministry work with Paul and later on with Peter and probably in Rome and then published his gospel for a persecuted community under the persecution of Nero from 64 to 68 in Rome. Uh, and so we also know something now about the date and about the place. I want to make one more, uh, clarify one more thing. When we look at our Bibles, we see, uh, you know, uh, chapter headings, 
uh, first of all, the heading of the whole book. Then we see chapter headings. Uh, we see verses. All of those things were added in later by editors of the Bible. They do not come from the original manuscript. So they're not part of inspired scripture, not part of the text of Mark's gospel. Now, I would have an assignment for you for the next session. Now, and my assignment is this, that you would read the gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of all the gospels that you would read it in one sitting. Now, I'm going to tell you an alternative in a moment, but uh, this is the reason for it. Because let's say like, for example, in this liturgical year, the Gospel of Mark is read in small sections during the week and on Sundays as well, with interruptions from the Gospel of John. Okay, but we never get the whole story. We only look at the trees and we miss the forest. But Mark put together a marvelous story about Jesus Christ. But that you can only get, you can only feel its impact, you can only experience it if you read it as one story, not in little snippets from one day to the next, and you don't remember what went before and went after, and you have no idea what the gospel as a whole wants to say. Now, to counteract, that's a weakness in the way the scripture is read in the church. Now, and in order to counteract that or to complement what we do on Sunday, uh, I would like you, if at all possible, to read the entire gospel in one sitting. It shouldn't take you more than two hours, or at least in two sittings, let's put it that way. Now, I have a great alternative for you. There is in YouTube a, a, a video that is a dramatic reading of the gospel of Mark, which is excellent. And you can also get that YouTube video. It will be on the slide. Uh, the, the link will be on the slide and will be given to you. Uh, and you can use that video uh, to watch it. And I think that would even be better than reading it because it really brings across the traumatic nature, the, the way the gospel is put together. And it's marvelous. Uh, and it's that experience, I think, that's going to be very, very important. I'm also suggesting, for those who have the time and the interest, that you would watch another video on YouTube. And that's a video by a lady called Paula, like Paul and A, Paula Gooder, G-O-O-D-E-R. Uh, introduction to the Gospel of Mark. So Paula Gooder, Introduction to the Gospel of Mark. It's an excellent introduction, but maybe a little bit difficult to understand for this reason, that she is from the United Kingdom, from England, and she has a bit of the, the English accent, and it needs a bit getting used to, but she's very clear in her presentation and so forth. Excellent. So, uh, so that would be another uh, Im, uh, important reference that would kind of like really help us in our study of the gospel, which we begin in the next section. And then let me just uh, share with you uh, two things to discuss in the action group that's devoted to this Bible study. The first thing to share about is what struck you when you read the gospel in one sitting or when you listened to the gospel uh, on that YouTube video. What impressed you? What struck you? Share your impressions on that with one another. And the second one for those, let's say, who have actually listened to the introduction by Paula Gooder, uh, uh, share what you've learned from her introduction you know, with the others in your group. And you may want to discuss it a little bit. But it's basically a sharing session of what you've learned by uh, reading the gospel in one sitting or watching it on, on YouTube and what perhaps you learned from the introduction to Paul Gooder. Now, let me just make one more comment before we end. I want to uh, uh, describe to you the way we our lessons, uh, uh, lessons will be structured. So when we come together next week, I will recap this session. Now, just quickly summarize it. 
And then I will be open for questions that people would write in. Uh, so if you have questions that come up, things that need clarification, whatever, send a message to us. And then I will spend some time answering these questions. And then thirdly, I will present new material. You know, together with discussion questions or study question, as the case may be. And then repeat that for the third session or fourth session and so forth. Now, next session, what we're going to do is look at the big picture. We're going to look at the way the Gospel of Mark is put together. And we're going to look at some of the major contents of the Gospel. So we want to get the lay of the land. We want to get an overview of, of the Gospel itself. Okay. Uh, I wish you all God's blessings for your reading. And may the Lord uh, give, uh, prepare your heart for a home for His Word. And may you be blessed by your study of the Scriptures. Thank you.